Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us once again, Fading Memories listeners. As always, I appreciate your listening. Every today is Michael Rost. He is the author of the book, The Journey Home, Portraits of Healing. So thanks for joining me, Michael. Michael is from my old, almost old hometown, one town over. So kind of nice to talk to a, a local, so to speak. <laughs> so thanks for joining us, Michael. Well, thanks for having me, Jen. I, I've been following your your podcast and, you know, the notion of fading memories is, uh, you know, it's a good title because those of us who are in the caregiving side of the of the equation, uh, ironically, we have more memory, or at least that was been my experience. As I see my parents' memories fading, more, my own memories have come flooding in, you know, of my childhood and past relationships. So, the idea of memory is such a rich part of human relationships. And I think, you know, as they fade in one or the other party, you know, we start to cherish them more and we start to value the memories more. And, you know, our own memories come flooding in and it just makes the whole act of caregiving so much more intense, I guess, sometimes or more rich or more. Um, you feel more vulnerable because it's partly your own memories that are on the line as well as your uh, loved one. I think it makes them more rich and vulnerable altogether. Yeah. And I, you know, vulnerability for most of the caregivers I, I run across, including my older sister, who was the primary caregiver in my parents' case, um, you know, they they don't women typically i mean my experience don't have as much trouble as men do in showing vulnerability or valuing vulnerability seeing vulnerability as a strength actually you know in a relationship and so it opened me up the caregiving experience opened me up to the idea to the reality that vulnerability is is the essential connection in the relationship and uh, I, I would say, you know, the last couple of years of my parents' life, they've passed away now. Um, we were both more vulnerable than ever in our entire lives. Uh, they maybe not by choice because, you know, as their memories were fading, they became much more transparent, if you will. Right. Um, and, you know, I just found that actually a very tender part of our relationship. And I, I came to value it as challenging as it was. I came to value it, um, you know, as an important part of my journey. So, I mean, I called I called this book the journey the journey home, um, and I think it's a, as much about my journey as about my parents' journey. Um, and you know, I, I I divide the book into really four parts, and I think there were like four phases of my journey. The, you know, the first set of vignettes or chapters I call uh, entering, and that's just like entering the world of dementia and nothing in my life. I've got a Ph.D. in linguistics and I study language and language acquisition and language loss, you know, how languages are acquired and how they're lost as well. Um, but nothing in my training prepared me <laughs> for the world of dementia, um, you know, and, and I think. You know, we all, or at least in my family, we felt like victims, like, why did this happen to us? And, you know, that's part of that entering phase. You're entering into this new world of perception, new world of, uh, well, new world of memory, for sure. A new world of interpretation of the truth. You know, what is true? <laughs> uh, you know, it's that's actually, that's actually a really good question because their reality is sometimes very different. And so their truth and our truth are pretty po almost polar opposites sometimes. And which one is more valid? You know, you, you start to question which one is more valid. And I, you know, I think that this may sound a little too new agey, you know, but uh, you know, whatever crosses your consciousness is real. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it has some reality to it for you. And so That's I think true. we need to value consciousness in the uh, dementia patient 
And if it's in their world of, of consciousness, it's, it's real. It's got some reality to it. And I think we need to acknowledge that because I know, I know I've heard you on some of your other podcast interviews, you know, talk about the struggles with um, the, um, what do you call them? The patient, the caregiving, yeah. caregiving. I, yeah, the caregiving, that works. I just refer to them as like your loved one. A loved one. Yeah. I mean, you, you get into these challenges where they'll challenge your reality, you know, that they'll challenge you. They'll say, you said this and you realize I didn't say that, but they think you said it. Uh, they imagine you saying that they imagine all kinds of slights and, you know, things going wrong. And um, I, I think just the strategy of not challenging the truth value of something helps. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just to, so you're upset about the the food or you're upset about the the air conditioning or you're upset about something you know that's that's a real thing and just work with the feeling of it or the perception of it rather than the truth of it i mean that mm -hmm. was one thing i learned early on but that whole entering process into this new world of dementia and caregiving is so new for us and there's no you know there's no preparation i mean no. i know that you, you know your podcast and other Others like you have gone out of your way to share some of the, the valuable lessons that you've learned. But even if you're prepared, you know, academically, right, you have all the books on caregiving, you're not prepared emotionally for you're entering this new world of dementia, dementia based reality. Yeah, I like that phrase. And most of us end up in this dementia based reality as a result of an emergency. You know, I'm a planner. I'm an organizer. That's how I get tons of things done in my life. And you can't, you know, nobody plans. You know, you don't sit down and go, okay, now let's plan for if mom or dad or whoever gets some form of dementia, you know, or your spouse gets, nobody sits down and does that. We all, we all hopefully are all working to, diligently to avoid that reality. And then it hits you and it's like being run over by a Mack truck. <laughs> So tell me yes. about yeah, your, they're... yeah, it's not, not a fun day. Tell me about, so you, both of your parents ended up with some form of dementia. That's, well, my that's mother a originally, my, my mother originally was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It was, um, you know, in fact, it's the first chapter in my book called Bridge Night. She was an avid bridge player. And uh, she and my father went over to a friend's house. I, th I think it was early August uh, of that particular summer. And, um, you know, the, the hand was dealt and she just said, I don't know how to play this game anymore. You know, and wow. there was like that moment where you, as the, as the dementia Re recipient or experiencer, there is a point at which you know if something is wrong that's beyond just, oh, I'm sleepy or I'm tired or something. Um, and she said, I can't play this game anymore. And from that point, you know, very rapidly over the next couple of months, you know, she couldn't remember how to cook. She couldn't remember how to, you know, fold laundry. She couldn't remember how to uh, do things that were part of her muscle memory her whole life. And my father, you know, they were living together, just the two of them. My older sister was living nearby. And so she would stop by and do a lot of the caretaking things. Uh, but eventually my father was at the end of his rope. I mean, he just didn't know how to take care of her anymore. And he, he had problems. He would call me frequently, um, you know, because he couldn't kind of, he had difficulty dealing with the, the accusations. Mm -hmm. Why did you not? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you? You know, and she was externalizing her own experiences onto him, you know, uh, projecting, I guess they call that in psychology, where um, and he, I, you know, as, as hard as he tried, it was getting getting to be a little too much for him. And one day my mother just couldn't get out of bed. She couldn't move her legs. And they wow. realized or, you know, I think that's neurological more than muscular, right? It was just she could not coordinate the movements anymore. Yeah, my understanding is the brain just forgets how to communicate those kind of things. 
to the lens, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, they they forget how to eat. Yeah. You know, how to swallow, how to, you know, bring the food, you know, it, it's, I mean, a, as a linguist, I've studied the brain and I've studied language and the brain is, it's an organ. It's just like the stomach or the heart. It's going to wear out, you know, whether or not it gets a disease, it's just going to change its functioning and it's going to, at some point, stop functioning completely. But, uh, you know, so my father calls my sister from work and they come and they realize today is the day that, you know, we can't, we can't physically take care of her anymore. And, the, and my sister had already arranged for a, um, you know, the assisted living facility to have a room ready for her. And so that very day, you know, the ER, what do they call it? The MR, the, the emergency, they come and they take her away. And I understand it was a very traumatic experience for her. I'm sure. You know, to be shuffled into an ambulance um, and, you know, the, the big metal doors slammed <laughs> shut. It's like, what happened to my life? And I do remember my sister told me my mother had a room in her house right near the front door called the prayer room. You know, it was like an extra bedroom that she had converted into like a meditation room with a lot of her religious symbolism and, you know, stuff on the walls and her books and all that. Uh, and I, she, my sister said she was like clutching at that room. Don't take away my prayer room. Don't take away. Okay. So she somehow knew that they were taking her away from her. Ouch. Life. And I think, you know, I wish there is some way for that transition process to be done more empathetically and less medically less officially you know but that transition marked sort of you know my mother's entry into the assisted living and my father uh, never was diagnosed with dementia but from that particular day onward you know he became more rem remote and lonely and uh, sad mm-hmm I think the the only way to make that transition less brutal is to not wait so long. And we're all guilty of it. My mom, we moved her into memory care after my dad died. She was very advanced stage. I facilitate a support group. And one of the members said she took my advice, which was not necessarily to move to a assisted living, I said, you know, you have to focus on your needs as well. She realized mm. that she needed somebody to cook, couldn't find anybody to come into the house and cook. They had a room, I guess they were on a waiting list at um, a Bay Area assisted living community. She and her husband, he's the one with the dementia moved in. And she's asking herself, why did I not do this sooner? She says she feels like she's on a cruise. They still have their home. She goes back there occasionally, you know, regularly just to, I don't know, do whatever she wants to do at their own home. Um, the apartment is quite small. I think she said it was about 400 square feet. So it's like, it, you know, that's, that's a little small. Of course, you have all the community and all the activities and stuff. She said her husband is doing better because he's got more activities. I mean, it's just like, she's just, she's almost kicking herself for not Why doing did, it sooner. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you know, it is a very, that's a, that was a, that was a brave decision, in my opinion, you know, to go from, I need somebody to come in and cook for us to move into an assisted living community. And it just thrills me that it's been so positive. But for my mom, oh, it took about six weeks for her to acclimate. And those first six weeks were horrible because she acted like a prisoner of war, you know, <laughs> and you'd go and visit. And she'd, you know, wail and cry because, you know, she didn't remember if my sister was there the night before and I came, you know, the next afternoon. And so, you know, not even 24 hours between visits, she didn't remember. So she just felt like she'd been abandoned. And, oh, that was awful. Yeah, that she... abandonment feeling or the feeling of, of being deprived of your, mm -hmm. your familiar life. And I, I think, you know, I think part of the reason that they waited so long till the very bitter end, you know, where she's being dragged out. Uh, it's, I, I think it's partly the ethic of my father, you know, bless his soul. You know, he always felt I can fix every problem there is. You know, he was a fixer. He was a, 
uh, doer, never, you know, I don't think I, he ever saw a doctor a day in his life. You know, he was like, I can heal this myself. I can take care of this myself. And, you know, I think we now know that's not a good strategy for no. things in life, particularly not this one. You know, no. that I think my sister and I should have talked him into the transition much more smoothly for her first and maybe even him at the very same time. But ironically, he, uh, you know, probably a, a year later, he also had a fall at home my father. And then we realized, you know, after we went to the ER with him and he got taped up and, you know, he, he refused any kind of medication, which is probably a good idea. You know, all the painkillers yeah. and other things are so addictive and they, they solve, they solve some problems, but they create others. Um, but we, you know, then we persuaded him, he's got to go into assisted living because if he falls again and nobody's there to take care of him and, and, you know, like you say, it's not it's not a, a it's not a prison. It's a mm -hmm. it's an invitation to a better life where you can uh, have people do things like your laundry and your cooking and cleaning and so on. And then you don't have to worry about that stuff. So he entered, uh, you know, about a year later. Um, and, you know, to go back to my book for just a second, you know, that first section is called The Entering, and it, that particular section of the book ends with her admission into uh, Cottingham Nursing Home. I call it Ellingwood in the book because the publisher said you have to use, you have to use a pseudonym. I don't even use my own name on the on the book. I use Gabriel Braun, which is kind of a, 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 a translation of my real name, Michael Ross. You know, Gabriel is an archangel. Michael is an archangel. <laughs> Ross is a German word for brown. Braun is a German word for brown. So that's sort of my trick. But they said you have to protect the privacy of the people in the book because, you know, they... Um, I know, I know a lot of people have written memoirs based on, you know, their real lives. And my publisher said, there's all kind of liabilities if you do that. What if the nursing home or the doctors say, you know, we didn't give you permission to use our information. I, and that actually scared me because I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm trying to help <laughs> people with the book, right? Right. So say, here are the lessons I learned from the caregiving experience. And if I can share those with other people, maybe they'll give a little more comfort to that first phase, at least of, you know, entering the, this new world. Um, but I, I think one, uh, we were talking before, before you, re, you started the recording about, you know, the journey of the, of the book is partly, mainly actually my journey into the caregiving world and I think that it's an opportunity, as challenging as it is and as awkward as, as it is and painful as it is at some points, we know that it's also an opportunity to discover something about yourself, mm -hmm. discover something about your family history. I mean, at least in my case, you know, there was that one year period when my mother was admitted admitted is not the right word, entered the, the facility, and my father did that. I spent a lot of time with my father, and we were we retraced some of the family history together. And um, there, there was one event in the book, which is a pivotal event, where he and I go back to the cafe. It's called the Rossley Cafe, where he grew up. He grew up on the second floor. His father and mother ran the cafe slash bar. And, you know, this is back in 1930s, uh, 40s. Um, and he had not been back to this place for decades. And I said, Dad, why don't we go? Why don't we go back and see it? You know, because we had a lot of time on our hands. <laughs> I mean, that's one thing you find when you're doing the caregiving role is there's a lot of time, right? I mean, you're sitting there for hours often together and i know some some guests that you've had and others i've talked to say you know when you do a visit plan an activity don't just mm -hmm. pretend, you know sit around and drink tea or you know ask do you remember questions that's not a good idea you know plan some activity it could be a game it could be an, a, an easy outing it could be you know some just something to do uh together 
And so we went back to the cafe and it just brought in a flood of memories for him. And he was actually quite upset that it didn't look like it was when he remembered it as a kid, obviously. <laughs> Stuff changes. What city was this in? Uh, this is Cincinnati. I was born okay. in Cincinnati and um, very, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful, as there are, are in America and, you know, most countries, these beautiful cities that represent so much of the cultural history. You know, there's a lot of German, uh, you know, I I went back this past Father's Day even, uh, and I went through the uh, the cemetery and almost every gravestone has some kind of German name. You know, you feel like you're in Berlin or something. <laughs> It's just, uh, but that's part of the cultural history of the of the place. And um, we went back to the cafe on that on that particular day. He was upset that it had deteriorated. Oh, and you know, deterioration is a big theme in caretaking, right? I mean, you see yeah. deterioration, mental deterioration, and I, as odd as this might sound, Jen, it's like I think there's a beauty in decay. If you can appreciate, if you can, you know, it's like going to an art museum and you see an old uh, Leonardo da Vinci painting or something, right? And you see the paint is cracking, but even that decay represents some beauty because, you know, it's part of the process of life is decay. Time. So that, that, that speaks to me because <clears throat> my other career was portrait photography. I know and that. Yeah, I loved the the falling down fences, the crumbly brick walls, the the rusty stuff. I mean, like if it, I drug the weirdest stuff home. My poor husband was like, "What in the hell, honey? What is what is this garbage? It's not garbage. Look, it's black. <laughs> so no, it's say, not garbage. It's not garbage. <laughs> I mean, there's a as you must know, there's a thin line. There's a thin line between valuing decay and becoming a hoarder. Yeah, of that's decay, true. You know? uh, but it, within that thin line area, there was some beauty, you know. And um, you know, when I went back to Cincinnati this past Father's Day, I was invited to speak at the Cincinnati Historical Society um, because, in the process of you know researching the book, I mean, most of the book is my own memories and interviews with people, and my sister did a great you know, kind of memory building process uh, and helping me remember things and re reconstruct things because she was there most of the time in real time. Um, but I was invited to go back just to just to talk about the uh, the cafes and the and the bars and the saloons in this area of Cincinnati called St. Bernard, where my father and, you know, grew up. And part of part of the process of doing this book enabled me to get back into the history of that area and my own family. And I even researched, you know, my ancestors back in Germany. And, you know, it, it's confusing because you never find out everything you want to know. So That's there's true. always a lot of gaps. Right. Um, but, you know, even if you find out just a few things, it just sort of enriches your sense of, um, you know, your family history. And that makes I, sense. I know there's a lot. And so what what that what the whole caregiving experience awakened to me was the sense of family history. And I realized I better find out as much as I can from my father before before it's too late. Right. Because once once their memories have faded completely and obviously once they pass away, you're just left with guesswork, you know. So I encourage a lot of caregivers to try. Not not to see it as a mortality race, but, you know, just to start to ask, not ask. I think you you and you've talked about this as well. Asking questions is often not a great way to start a continual conversation with an elder who's having memory issues. You know, so they, you might just make a picture or you might tell something you remember. And if they chime in. You know, but it, I found out with my father, especially if I ask a question, Dad, do you remember? You know, the answer was almost no, I don't remember. Yeah, no, and it's sometimes seen as a challenge, too. Right. They like might you're, think you're challenging them. How come you can't remember? You know? Yeah. Like, it, like you're quizzing them. Yeah. Nobody that's how my, that. No, that's how my mom got. We all get a little testy. You know, somebody's like, 
well, I know I told you, don't you remember? You're like, obviously I don't, or, you know, we just immediately go to like a 10, <laughs> you know, like maybe not a 10, but yeah, it's like, I don't know. Well, it's at least not in my life. I don't know anybody that says, no, I'm, I'm really sorry. I don't, I don't remember you telling me that. Uh, I don't know why humans are that way, but that's how we are. Yeah. I had three, three generations of memory loss with my, my mom, my maternal grandmother, and my maternal great grandmother. So there are a lot of gaps. And I keep threatening to get with my uncle and go over family photos and all that stuff. But be, because of the overlapping needs of my mom's care and my grandmother's care, there's kind of a rift. So families can be a pain in the rump sometimes. Yeah. But and then, you know, we all have, all families have these sensitive areas that, for whatever reason, we don't talk about these things. And like in in my case, I mean, just to share one bit of that cafe story. After we visited, I, you know, it opened up a lot of emotion for my father. And he he and that's about the time when I realized his own age related dementia was reaching a point where he was having confusions about what's present and what's past. Mm, that's you know? interesting. So when we when we visited the cafe and he was upset about it not being the way he remembered it and it being deteriorated, meaning they didn't take care of it well. You know, when we got back to the car, uh, this really steamy day, and you know, uh, he said he started rattling off all the names of people down at City Hall he was going to call. <laughs> these are people who probably from the 1940s. You know, that's funny. And it, there is a layer of humor in it, but that, that I think that might have been the first moment I realized, oh, 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 this is dementia. I mean, I think we all have fantasies like that. <laughs> like if so and so was alive today, I'd give him a call and tell him, you know. But he's not making that that link to if he was alive today. It was like I'm going to call Gus Wertheimer. He's going to come down and, you know, read the riot act to them. They can't do that to my father's place, you know, but it, the, 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 the emotion was pride and, you know, some, some sense of, you know, wanting to reclaim his life that had been gone, you know, and I think that as a caregiver, you want to value the positive part of the emotion. Not mm -hmm. the dad. he's dead. Those people are all dead. You know, yeah. if you attack the, the truth value of something, it's not going to, you're not going to get the richness of the experience out of it. So I think it's not, not a positive richness for sure. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. There is a day. Right. Uh, but I, I think we, you know, I try to invoke what I call the 80, 20 rule after being with my father during that, that, year, that gap year, I would call it, you know, where before he went into assisted living and after my mother had, left him you know gone into assisted living um you know he i i i call it the 80 20 rule because i say okay if i'm going to say something negative that'll be 20 percent. i've got to reinforce it with 80 percent positive stuff mm -hmm. you know and usually in in our everyday life it's the opposite you know we're like 80 percent negative 20 percent positive with people and so i, I realized definitely that, need to flip that Right. So I would I would try to, you know, cushion everything that might be slightly negative with something positive, you know, uh, to to just kind of balance things out. I think my the millennials, like my daughter and son in law, um, what do they call that a compliment sandwich. So it's like a, a criticism in between two compliments. And then they also have a phrase called a comp compl salt. So it's a or comp it's an insult. And a compliment all like <laughs> twisted together. <laughs> They're weird, but that's okay. We love yeah. them. Yeah. But yeah, well, it's kind of. Kind I think of a, those kind of those kind of compliment sandwiches, whatever we call them, you know, I think they're really important in the you know these elder care moments uh, because it's just so easy to go to the negative so quickly. You know, Dad, those people are dead. You can't call them. You know, that's not the point of his. That's not the point of the conversation, actually. And, you know, if I could do it all over again, I think I would say, Dad, I know you feel really strongly about, you know, the place not being as nice as you wanted it to be. That's really 
sweet of you. That's really important. I'm glad you shared that with me. You know, even that statement is positive, right? I'm glad you shared that with me because it, it's kind of a way of saying, you know, your effort at communication has been successful on that level, right? I get it. Wow, that's really a strong emotion you have. You know, thanks for sharing that. Uh, and, you know, I'm not like this all the time, but I try to remind <laughs> myself, you know, in these in these more vulnerable moments, you know, go for the positive or go for the impact of it rather than, you know, picking at the truth value of it. But in in just to just to summarize what I was saying about the the book, I call that first section entering into the world. The second second the second section of the book I called listening. That's the section in which like this trip back to the cafe happens, where I just say, okay, if I want to survive in this dementia based world, I better start listening because it's a new language, it's a new world, it's a new reality. I better just start becoming more of a listener than a a responder right away, you know, just what can I learn? What can I learn from this new world? And then the third section I called connecting, which is mostly about experiences in the nursing home where, you know, when I'd go to visit my mother, I would talk to some of the people, who, you know, her roommates and her, you know, table mates at lunch. Um, and just realizing that the stories they had were, amazing but you had to kind of work at it to get the, to the stories right yeah uh, my mom was a diane and she hung out with two other dianes so we had diane other diane and other other diane as if that's not confusing for those of us who don't have cognitive issues and a lot of people thought i was crazy because i would take two of them you know like mom and one other we'd go to the park <laughs> or we'd go to the nail salon and people would be like are you crazy it's like actually it's easier to deal with both of them because they talk to each other and then I can be a bystander or a facilitator like, or something. Yeah. It's like, they don't really need me to lead the conversation. They'll just ran Like we went to a regional park and we were sitting at, um, at a picnic table and there was a very steep, uh, it wasn't a legitimate for lack of a better word path. It wasn't, I don't know what you want. I don't know what the right word would be. It was it was it was a shortcut path that very nimble people had created uh -oh. because it was extremely steep. I mean, this was like a slide on your rump down the hill kind of kind of little path. And these two ladies yapped about that freaking path for twenty minutes. And I and it was just interesting because you could see the moms that they were because they were talking about how. You know, they were they would be afraid to go down. They didn't want the kids to go down it when there were no kids present except for me. And I mean, they weren't referring to they weren't thinking of me when they were thinking of kids. And it was just I could just relax in the in the warm air and the sunshine and the nature. And just, you know, if I needed to tune out the 15th time, they talked about how steep, steep the path was. I could tune it out, you know, just kind of keep an eye on them. And they <clears throat> would talk to each other and. They'd help each other. It was just, it was really fascinating. Um, I was going to ask you, so the, was it difficult to learn the listening part of your journey with your mom? Because that was a huge struggle for me. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. 
Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, yes. The the listening part, yeah, like you were saying, repetition, you know, the repetition, the repetition, the repetition. Uh, and, you know, fighting my own impatience with it and wanting to move on and just learning that, you know, I mean, my mother having Alzheimer's, I came to expect the repetition. My father, you know, was somewhat in a different kind of dimension. I mean, I talked with one of your colleagues, I, you probably know Tipa Snow in this. Mm -hmm. dimension world. I, I had an interview with her recently, and she said there's like a 100 different kinds of dementia. Yeah. And she even stopped talking about labeling things. She says brain changes. People That's are true. Having brain changes. Uh, my, but my father's brain changes. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I try to listen to what what are they saying? And a lot of times, you know, I, I realize I almost have to invent a new language because if you if you invoke the, you know, like I know you were a top level professional in your field and you expect things to happen in an efficient way. Right. Efficiency is not part of that world. You know, it's there's a sense of mutual appreciation of feeling or something like that. And, you know, there's it's almost timeless. Some of the visits feel almost like they are lasting forever or, you know. Um, but, yes, I felt like I had to learn to listen to a new language. And I tried to understand that, you know, I mean, my background is in language study. And I said, you know, there's a new language here. I mean, some of it is touch. You know, mm -hmm. I, especially with my mother. I mean, as soon as we were together, you know, I, I just put my hand on her elbow and just slightly massage. And that helps the idea of that the verbal part of the communication is going to be. You know, it's not going to progress very far or it's going to keep occurring. It's going to keep cycling back to the same things. But, you know, so the touch kind of helps. I learned to make more eye contact with her. You know, it's kind of uncomfortable, right, in your normal world to look into people's eyes for a long time. You usually just make eye contact and look away. So I just make more eye contact and hold the eye contact longer and realize that it doesn't have any social meaning. You know, like I'm not probing anything or I'm not questioning anything. I'm just kind of maintaining contact. So the touch and the eye contact uh, with my mother. Uh, my father had another language with my mother. I, you know, she was very religious, you know, so sometimes we'd say prayers, even though I, I was raised very, you know, religious household, but I, I appreciate the value of religion for its rituals mm -hmm. and its sense of reverence for something greater. That's really important. Um, but so with my mother, you know, we would say prayers, we would sing hymns, <laughs> you know, that we would sing at, you know, services, um, because she didn't, she'd remember those ver verbatim, you know, she never forgot the, those things from childhood. Um, you know, so songs and prayers and she loved pictures. So I'd bring pictures. Um, one of your guests, Jen, was it, I'm trying to remember Montessori method. Didn't oh you? yeah. Cameron camp. Okay. He's he was talking about you know, working with what they have left and not just assuming they can't do things. He right. was telling me about yeah, like uh, physical care. activities and yeah, he was he was talking about a care home where the it was predominantly women, which unfortunately that's typical. These women would go to the so this was I believe in France. They'd go to the market and pick out the vegetables for the meals for the week. They'd plan the meals pick out the ingredients and there's a video that he showed me where like this one gal has got this big chopping knife and she's chopping vegetables mm -hmm. and it's like, yikes, you know, my first reaction is, uh, is that a good idea? And he said it was muscle memory and it, you know, it's like in a contained or controlled environment, 
it was safe. You know, it's like, obviously they'll give the woman the knife and just, you know, not pay attention in case something changes. And then she decides to use it on her neighbor or something. But, you know, they, (laughs) they had, um, you know, the social aspect of planning together, shopping together, preparing things. Um, they, they had a tool, like one gal, I can't remember. I think she was a stroke patient. So she didn't have use of one limb very well. And they had this little device. So she's like chopping up carrots one handed. And it was, it was fascinating. Yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, I think back to when my kids were little, you know, the, the, the daycare activities and the Montessori type of activity, the whole point is participation. It's not mm-hmm. about performance. It's right. Right. Everybody's involved. And, and I think what, what um, the dementia patient loses is a sense of participation. So I think there's a fine balance between doing everything for them and letting them participate and make choices. You know, should we use the these little carrots or the bigger carrots, you know, mm-hmm. for this recipe? And it doesn't matter. It's just the question is, you know, you're making the choice and you're part of the process and participating. And I think that's good for the caregiver also is to have activities that involve, you know, some motion and some movement. But what I was thinking, it's not the Montessori guest you had. It was the other one who wrote her own picture books. Anna's the, books or something? Nana's books? Nana's books. Oh, those are awesome. I I ordered some. They haven't come yet. But when I heard them on, um, I heard they were on your podcast. But I did that thing kind of ad hoc with my mother. I would bring pictures, uh, you know, like th- this book has a lot of visuals in it, but I would bring pictures that she liked and we would just sit and hold the picture and like, w- you know, and say, oh, that's your dog, Hayes, Hayes, you know, and she's almost like communicating with the pictures. And then we would, so th- we would develop a visual language, a touch language, a nonverbal eye contact language you know, some activities with participation, even if she wasn't 100% sure what she was doing. You know, so that's what I mean by developing new languages and not not focusing so much on the verbal um, as a a form of connection, right? So I could have have used that advice a few years ago because my mom thought I was her best friend. I'm sure you were. (laughs) Yeah, well, I finally landed on going to the park to watch children. Cause I tried all of the, you know, simplify the hobbies they had. My mom was really creative. So I came up with very um, easy art projects that weren't childish. And she stressed about doing it wrong, which stressed me out, which then stressed her out more. And it was just, bleh, didn't work. I tried looking at the old scrapbook. That that my sis- well, it was my sister. My sister had made it a photos of, the two of us, she had zero clue who any of those people were, which was, you know, I'd, I'd heard, you know, like they might not recognize newer, you know, more modern current photos, but they'll probably remember like stuff from back in your childhood. Nope. That didn't work either. She didn't recognize pictures of herself back in the day. So I'm like, all of this advice did not work for me, which is how the podcast well, I, I think, started. I think inventing the new language with the loved one. I think there are no rules in that you need to follow. So like if pictures don't work, try something else. You know, another thing with my mother was, you know, she she was an avid gardener her whole life. And fortunately, this uh, nursing home in Cincinnati had a beautiful garden. Uh, and so I would push her wheelchair out and we would just sit in front and you know, I, I would sometimes do this. I would give, I would say, I think that's called a petunia. And she goes, no, Michael, that's, <laughs> <laughs> she, you know, so she had like the language of botany or flowers in her. And it didn't matter what she called them, but it was the idea of just trying to find what her remaining interests were. Because, you know, one one thing I remember back in the entering phase to of this world with my mother was we were standing this is while she's still at home before the nursing home we're standing in front of the mirror you know 
Um, and she's, you know, she said, Michael, who is that? And I said, who? that's me and you in the mirror. And she said, I know that's you, but who's that? She couldn't recognize herself. And and she she started tearing up. And I I mean, I remember this as it happened yesterday. She she said, I don't remember anymore what I love. Mm. And I felt I felt so touched by that, meaning that's, I think, the danger of Alzheimer's. It's not that you forget names of faces and, you know, names of flowers and such. And or even forget how to cook or play bridge. But you forget what your passions are. So I think the language you're trying to develop is what re-enliven their passions. You know, if, if it was art, if it was photography, if it was gardening, if it was people, if it was travel, uh, music, prayer, whatever it was, you know, bring some of that back. Because I think if you see in their eyes, oh, the passion is reigniting. That, that's when they remember who they are. You know, even though they're forgetting a lot of the frontal lobe stuff of the names and the places and the connections, they, you know, the, the deeper part of the brain, the amygdala remembers your passions and remembers your uh, goals in life, maybe, or your, you know, your raise, your reason for living kind of feeling. And I, I think that's what, what I mean by developing a new language, forget the whole memory, verbal memory stuff and just go, for, if you can, you know, enliven <laughs> some of the memories. It could be like food, could be music, it could be people it could be dance you know even if you can't move maybe we used to do like i um we used to do chair yoga you know where we would and she could move make very minor movements and she wasn't really into it frankly but she knew i liked it so she would kind of humor me <laughs> <laughs> so my mom's passion that and this is where the being in the care home was actually really beneficial first off she had friends she would not have had if she had lived at home or with me. Mm -hmm. But she, because she was 77 when she passed away. So many of the people in the care home were significantly older. My mom did not need a cane or a walker. And so she was always telling the other residents, well, let me know if I can be of any help. And which always cracked me up because I thought, lady, you could barely help yourself. <laughs> There's certainly not not a lot that you are going to be able to do for these other people, but that, you know, it, it, I think that's just what gave her a, a meaning of being up every day. There was one day, yeah, yeah. so they, her, their situation, she had the private room and they had a Jack and Jill bathroom and then a second private room. And we were sitting in the dining room and the resident who had the adjoining room to hers um, I guess I'm not exactly sure what happened. She was in her nineties and she needed a walker and she was not really super stable, but she went to stand up and she, she slipped off the couch onto the floor. Thankfully she didn't really fall it's more of a slide. And my mom and the other Diane go rushing in there and they're like, trying to yank this lady off the floor. And I'm like, ah, please stop. Cause I didn't know if she was injured. And of course, they, their, their instinct was to help, right? Yeah, help, help. it right. was it was hard to get them not to, but I was afraid that they were going. They would hurt themselves, their, right? Or yeah. her? Yeah, she was not. Let's see, I'm five foot two, so she was probably my height and frail. And it was like, and they're like yanking on her arms. This is like, ay ay ay, please stop. Um, thankfully, everybody was fine, but it was just that was just her instinct. She was always wanting to help and. You know, it was it. I was at close to the end because we the last year of her life, she was very she was a bit combative and she liked to claw people. If you irritated her, you might you might get the claws. Yeah, it was not fun. She drew blood on caregivers. It was mm. embarrassing because it's like that's I mean, my mom could be pretty harsh with some words, but, you know, drawing blood on people is probably a little out there for her. And so I was trying to find ways to give her things to do, ways to feel helpful that didn't burden the staff, you know, like put the right. napkins on the tables. And I just never really came up with anything that I felt I, I probably should have spent more time there and worked harder at it. But 
you know, in hindsight, we were at the very end, so it probably would have just been an exercise in frustration. But that's kind of one of the things that I suggest to people is, you know, find ways they can help Mm. that even if they're a complete failure at it, like, can you put the napkins on the tables and they all end up on a heap on one chair? Or, yeah, I I, I think I think that's a great example, Jen, that the idea of if, if you know your mother's passion is to help, right? find ways to even guide her hand to put the napkins on the table or, you know, and thank her for the effort. You know, again, it's not about the results. It's not about the performance. It's about trying to tap into something that they remember who they are and remember what gives them pleasure and uh, meaning. I know that we're winding down here, but I wanted to say like the last section of the book I call coming home. And that's when, you know, I know this has a sad layer to it but that's when you know it's death is imminent right and then you start to change your strategies to just how can you how can you help help them pass with dignity Mm -hmm. you know and all the other rules i think go out the window about communication and everything else it's just sort of like what what can i do to help you die with dignity and um you know, I, I'm sure that's the moment that everybody, when they enter this world, they're trying to push back out of their consciousness, you know, because I think when you see the first signs of dementia, part of you says they're going to be dead. They're going to die soon. Right. Or mm-hmm. something. It, you know, this is the last chapter. Mm-hmm. I think when people see that, I mean, in your case, you say your mother lasted, lasted, uh, lived for 20 plus years with dementia. Yep. Um, I think most of us have, you know, shorter time frames than that. But I think I think you start grieving right away when you see she has dementia. You start grieving not that they're dying so much as I've lost my relationship with her. Yeah. And I have to reinvent. But there's a grieving process as soon as you understand the diagnosis, right? Mm-hmm. And the real grieving process, though, starts when they when you know they're dying, you know, like the la- you see this is the last month or the last week or the last day. Right. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get that with my mom because she fell and broke her leg right at the start of the pandemic, March 8th, 2020. Oh, and then she was isolated and you couldn't see her. Yep. I did see her the day before she passed away, but I didn't see her for two weeks. So for two weeks, I was. I was more concerned that she would forget the relationship she thought we had, me being her best friend, and that she wouldn't trust me. And so, I mean, I practically like isolated in my office because I didn't have anything else to do, worked from home forever. And I was at the point where I was going to call the executive director, who I had a good relationship with. He was He's a wonderful human. And I was like, you know, take the bolt off the window. I'll climb through the window because my mom's like climbing through the window would have been easy, except it only opened up about four inches. So I'm not quite that skinny. And I was just, I was really stressed about that. And they called and suggested that she might benefit from a visit from me, which I now know was uh, <laughs> not exactly what they meant, but that's how they got me there. And when I saw her, it was like, yeah, this isn't going the way I was expecting. And so it wasn't a surprise that she passed away the next day, but that whole two weeks was kind of wild, but that's what happens when you lose somebody during the pandemic. And it's yeah, just, that's a double tragedy, you know, that, and especially if she has dementia and she doesn't know why you abandoned her, if that crossed her mind, yeah, then maybe, maybe it didn't, you know, I don't uh, think so, but I have a video of her saying, you know, uh, and, cause the caregiver got her kind of laughing a little bit and so the caregiver was talking to her and I was recording on my phone and she goes, you know, just time just flies by. And I'm thinking, Oh my. And now you look back on it and you're like, Oh, within two weeks she was gone. It was just, it's like, it's almost creepy, but it's also kind of, um, I don't know. I'm not sure what the right word. It was. It, Very cool. <laughs> yeah. But you, you were talking about the, the last, the coming home phase. The coming home phase. I think, I think that is the phase where, you know, we know it's over. 
I mean, it could be a day, it could be two weeks, it could be, you know, whatever period. And and I don't think any story of a caregiver is complete without that part of it. You know, how did you deal with the complete loss? Because I think as caregivers, you know, uh, we tend to think of solutions and how to solve problems. And so, but there's an internal aspect to it also of finding our own meaning in the caregiving process, not just solving her problem or his problem, you know, and doing the best we can and consulting each other for the best solutions. I think we need to pay attention to our own journey. You know, so during during this period, I kept like journals of my dreams uh, and they, some of them were disturbing and I understood mm. them only much later. But I think we need to pay attention to those as, you know, our internal process is also part of the story. I mean, we're doing our best to solve their problems or help alleviate their suffering. Right. At the same time, we don't want to suffer more ourselves. So we want to enrich our own story, I think. Um, and so the last chapter, the last set of chapters I call coming home is, is you know, uh, about the, the exit process. And, the, you know, the last the last vignette is visiting their graves a year later, you know, right next to each other, overlooking a lake and Gate of Heaven Cemetery, it's called in Cincinnati. And and just trying to ce- ce- celebrate. I know that sounds a little new agey, but you know that it was uh, it was a good relationship. You know, it had difficult moments, particularly near the end. But you know, I want to remember the the whole thing of it, and it's even what you're remembering. I think is even bigger than your relationship. You're remembering kind of a whole flow of life, and I think if we can tap into that. It's be- It's a beautiful experience. Well, that's really, that's obviously a perfect place to end. And it's a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an excellent thought. I wanted to, to tie it back into also you were saying that at some point you have to shift to how can I help you die with dignity? Because I think we become so in, so in great, you know, engaged with caregiving and caring, caring, caring that we, have a difficult time letting go. Mm. And I mean, I, I know so many people who wait way too long to call hospice. They don't bring palliative care in earlier on. And it's just, and everybody, I don't want to say suffers because that's not necessarily true, but there's, there's a little more suffering than there needs to be. And mm. so I love that question. How can I help you die with dignity? Because eventually we're all going to die. And I think we'd all like to die that way. So those two thought processes right there at the end are just, they're beautiful. So how, how can people find you, your book, all those good things? Well, I, I, I mentioned, I wrote this under a pen name, Gabriel Braun, the journey home portraits of healing, but my real name is Michael Ross. Uh, I have a website, lateral communications, which is about my, my life as a linguist. This is, this is only, this is the only uh, non, what is this? This is the only fiction or memoir book I've ever written. All my other work is in the um, uh, you know academic world. But uh, I have a website called gabrielbraun.com, which is just about this book and caregiving. And I'm I'm learning from from you, Jen, and others who've dedicated so much of your energy and uh, knowledge and experience to help others. You know. I, I would say not only die, the die with dignity is a very heavy piece, maybe, but, you know, in, approach caregiving with dignity as well. You know, that it's a, it's a very noble act and you should be proud of yourself for undertaking it. Cause thank you. <clears throat> um, you know, it's very important work and uh, you know, and I appreciate your levity and your lightness about, you know, cause we have to appreciate the humor and the, and the lighter aspects as well. That's true. It's not well, just no, work. Nobody's going to want to listen to a depressing podcast. <laughs> I don't want to put out a depressing podcast. So I want to leave you because you said that you've sampled some different episodes. There's one, I think it's early in 2019 called Forgetfulness or Lost Language. And since you're a linguist, I think you might find that one actually really interesting. Okay. I okay. did. And I'm just a creative, not just, I'm a creative person and an entrepreneur. 
So I don't I don't have any fancy numbers or numbers. Oh my goodness, must be time for lunch. Any fancy letters after my name? So you know, I'm just I I learned so much from my guest. It's you know, that's one of the reasons I keep doing this because I'm still learning and I feel like the um, communication and sharing is growing, which is good because so is the problem of more people having this disease or a some form of dementia type disease. And so, plus I would have nothing else to do anyway. <laughs> so well, so I thank great. you. I, I appreciate the invitation and great talking with you. You too. So you have a fantastic afternoon and I appreciate you uh, coming on today. All right. Great. Thank you, Jen. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.